I'm Grant Gonaut, and this is the 15th episode of the Modcast, where we're going to talk about what a pre-tribulation rapture means for us as Christians. And so, please right now subscribe to us, follow us on Instagram, and check out all of our audio platforms, which will be in the link in the description. So, um, the rapture, first let's define what mm -hmm. the rapture is. And so, the rapture is an eschatology uh, term. And eschatology is the study of end, end times, end things to come in the world. But the rapture is the concept consisting of an end time event when all Christian believers who are alive, along with resurrected believers, will rise again in the clouds to meet with the Lord in the air. That's what the rapture is. Now, the rapture regarding when it takes place, we obviously recognize that it's a very controversial issue within Christianity. And um, the main views are pre-trib, mid-trib, and post-trib. We recognize that there's all of these views, but we're going to talk about why we believe pre-trib is the most consistent view. And if pre-trib is the right view, what that means for us and Christians mm -hmm. and how we should go about living. Um, so a main passage to look at is in Daniel 9, Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, which talks about all of the weeks. And in the 70th week, which we're still awaiting for, is a period of seven years, which is yet to come. But in that passage, it's talking about Israel. So if you turn to Daniel 9, you can read that whole passage in there where Daniel's given the vision. And it's dealing with Israel specifically there. And obviously, we could get into the nitty gritty and study each word of what, what things mean. But for right now, for time's sake, we're just going to hit... A brief overview so now one of the primary rapture passages which we're going to turn to is first Thessalonians 4 before we dig in to this passage in first Thessalonians chapter 4 the 70th week in Daniel which we're talking about the seven years is a period of tribulation which will there will be lots of persecution on earth and we can read about all of these they're, they're all throughout the book of Revelation and in other prophetic books that we can read about. But the primary passage regarding the rapture is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting in verse 13, which reads, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest your sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who are asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we are who alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will raise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up and together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus, what, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words." So that's the primary passage regarding the rapture. And in there we read in verse 17, Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That's what being raptured means in the Greek. It means to be caught up. And um, so that is the main passage that many of the tribulation views stem, um, stem from. And so the rapture is removing God's people from this earth. And so just right after that, in chapter 5, so briefly after, in this next chapter, Paul, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, now this is verse 9, he says, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but mm -hmm. to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. What did God not appoint us for? For yeah. wrath. And so that's where a lot of these will, like, we recognize that's where a lot of these differing views come in. A lot of people say within the seven years, when does the wrath actually begin? Is the wrath halfway through? There's a new view pre-wrath, which is like three quarters the way through. And then you have post-trib. But as pre-tribulationists, we believe that we will be raptured and then that will mark the, seven peri mm -hmm. the, the period of tribulation. We believe all seven years is God's wrath mm -hmm. and is not demonic in origin is all God's wrath justified because he is a righteous judge. And so 
Um, a thing that we can look at here is we look at in First Thessalonians, the first passage we look at, First Thessalonians chapter four, verses thirteen through eighteen, and then shortly after, First Thessalonians five, chapter five, verse nine. And so, we know God's character is one that does not; He does not contradict Himself. So it wouldn't make much sense for Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, in chapter four to record us being caught up in the air rescued by the Lord, and then briefly after that in the next chapter, talking about how the Lord is going to not appoint us to wrath. The reason we say this is inconsistent is because why would God not appoint us to wrath, but then call us to live throughout the seven years of tribulation when Paul, a couple verses before, told told us how he would rescue us. Mm -hmm. That's inconsistent. God wouldn't try and trick us there. Mm-hmm. And now, obviously, we could, we could get technical, like we said earlier, and check out, okay, what is this Greek word here? What is this Greek word there? What is, when does Paul use this language, that? But if we do take a literal and consistent approach to prophecy, a futuristic view, the pre-trib is what makes most sense and has the most support scripturally. So I'm going to dig into one more passage, but right now Beck's going to talk about the implications for if a pre-trib rapture mm-hmm. is what we are expecting. Yeah. So if this doctrine of Jesus Christ's imminence is true, right, that he could come at any moment, um, it should influence how we live. If I told you right now you knew with certainty that there was two hours till Jesus Christ came back and you're a Christian— uh-huh. What would you do? I mean, you probably wouldn't, I don't know, sit on your phone for two hours. You probably wouldn't go out in your backyard and shoot hoops for two hours. No, I bet you'd probably be calling up all your friends and family, telling th- them about the gospel of Jesus Christ, and pleading God for th- their salvation. See, this should be a motivating factor for Christians, that Jesus Christ can come back at any moment, right? And we want to be found blameless, like it says in Philippians, um, without reproach, we want to be spotless for when um, Jesus Christ comes for his church, right? And we're his bride. Um, so, firstly, what it should do is it should cause us to share the gospel. Yeah. Because Jesus could come back at any second. And so, um, always have a gospel-centric, focused mindset where you're... Um, anybody that you meet, anybody that you encounter... Um, you're praying about how you can best share the gospel with them because everybody obviously needs it. And then two, um, it should cause us to remove the sin out of our life, um, to look more like Jesus Christ, um, to be more sanctified. Like I was saying in Philippians, it says to be blameless when Jesus Christ returns. Yeah. Right? We want to be blameless um, for Jesus because we're his bride, right? Um, like no. say say that you were gone... Uh, the husband was gone for a weekend, right? Um, he wouldn't want to return to a house that was like, you know, all messy, kind of crazy. He had a business trip, you know, he's whatever, tired. Right? The, the wife would have every, try to have everything cleaned up, orderly, put in place. And that's kind of like how Jesus, when he comes back, right? What, what do our lives look like? Are they all chaotic or um doesn't mean that we have to have all our ducks in a row in terms of we have to have a 401k and a financial plan and good investments and our kids have college paid for but it's we have god as our priority yeah in that sense right that jesus christ is on the throne of our hearts and we're not making time for sin we're making time to read the word to pray to share the gospel Mm -hmm. and we want to be found like that when he returns and this kind of plays into that healthy fear of judgment because ultimately Everybody's going to be judged. A non-Christian is going to be judged based on their salvation and on their own righteousness. We're going to be judged based on the works that we did. Um, It says in Hebrews that we have to give an account to Jesus, to God, for everything that we've ever done. Mm -hmm. So in a healthy fear way, in a way that we're just out of respect and out of awe, we're going to have to stand before God one day and tell him what we did in our life and try to... And um, we're going to have to give an account for it. So we should be motivated to live um, a generally holy life 
to the best of our ability as we depend upon the Lord because one day we're going to have to give an account for everything that we've ever done. And so we don't want to have those things burn up and be worthless, but we want them to be um, eternal and to last through that judgment. So <coughs> what are you doing? So first yeah. of all, um, share the gospel. Second of all, start to live a life that looks more like Jesus Christ, free from sin, alive to God. Um, and so that's how it should motivate us to live. Mm-hmm. And so back there talked about some practical implications regarding the truth of a pre-tribulation rapture. Now, like we talked about earlier, <clears throat> the book of Revelation written by John, there's a lot of uh, language there talked about things that are to come. Obviously, there's other views, too, that believe that they've already happened, but we take the stance that these things are to come future. We have a futuristic approach to them. And so in Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, it reads, because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on earth. And so the main part that we're going to look at in this verse is that God will keep us from the hour of trial. We already read in 1 Thessalonians 5 how he hasn't appointed us to, su- uh, to suffer wrath. Mm-hmm. And here he tells us that he'll keep us from the hour of trial. Now, this from the hour of trial, that word from... In the Greek, it means from. So there's two views on what it can mean. Is One is means that God could protect believers throughout tribulation, which is where the mid-trib and pre-wrath views come in, because that means, okay, God is being patient with and that he promises to keep us from tribulation, and so that he could protect us. Or the second view, which is a pre-trib view, is that he could deliver us from mm-hmm. it. And, but it does say, it's interesting because it says, I will keep you from the hour of trial. When it says the hour there, Mm -hmm. that means the time period of, Mm -hmm. and the time period is all seven years, not halfway through, not three quarters of the way through from the hour of it, from Mm -hmm. the time Mm -hmm. of the trial, which is all seven years. All seven years is a trial. Mm -hmm. And so that's what he promises to keep us from. And that's what lines up most consistently with all other, other eschatology passages. And so we should take this seriously because, like we said, when these main passages are being interpreted literally and consistently, the pre-trib interpretation is the most biblically Mm -hmm. based interpretation. Mm -hmm. And um, like Beck was saying, the return of Christ, it talks about constantly how it's going to be imminent. It's going to be at a blink of an eye. Matthew 24, 26 talks about how no man knows the day, the hour, nor the Mm -hmm. time. The Father knows that. So how that, like Beck talked about how that should cause us to live is actively we should be constantly checking our lives spiritually because we want to run the race well and mm-hmm. we want to finish well. Mm-hmm. And so Romans 10, 9, what does that read? Be, because, if, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If we're unsure about these things, God wants to save us. God wants mm-hmm. to not appoint us to wrath. And... So we should seek him. If we're not saved, God wants to save us. Mm -hmm. There's many truths within scripture. There's many resources we can go to seek him. He wants to be our father, our shepherd. And a pre-tribulation rapture isn't to be feared either. A lot of people call it like the secret rapture, like God's being. No, whenever it happens, the whole world will know. Mm -hmm. It's not, there's nothing secret about it. So we should live lives of active faith, evangelizing, telling people about what they should fear Mm -hmm. in a healthy way because our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is going to come back and the whole world will know that he's here to Mm -hmm. rescue us from the tribulation. And it's not something to shed tears over. It's something to worship over, to give praise for. So a lot of these doctrines sometimes scare people, but they actually, when studied, produce a joy and like it talks in about an acts we are to be bereans so we can it, these these are our views and we understand that there's many other theologians that hold to different views but mm-hmm. we're going to search the scriptures and subjectively we're through the through the guidance of the holy spirit select what we think lines up most biblically mm-hmm. in all views though there's sometimes tension between them but there really is none because all, at the end of the day all of the views regarding the rapture and the millennium 
all still result in Jesus Christ coming back for his church and us mm -hmm. one day spending mm -hmm. eternity with him, which is the beauty of the whole picture. So um, Beck and I, we and everyone, we encourage you to live these lives of expectance and an imminent return of Christ and to just be spiritually aware of where we stand now because Christ is always looking to refine us and grow mm -hmm. us more in our walk. So thank you for tuning into the 15th episode of the Modcast where we discussed what a pre-tribulation rapture is and means for us as Christians. Please once again subscribe to us on YouTube, follow us on Instagram, and check out all of our other podcasts on audio platforms. Thank you. Peace.